Well, hello, I'm John Tyner. I'm president of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. And this is the first of our um, fall suite of events. The interesting thing about the Washington County Public Affairs Forum is that we meet on Mondays at the Pepper Mill restaurant. But because of the peculiarities of the calendar, there are only eight open dates for um, uh, forum programs. And so there are a whole bunch of um, initiatives, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine measures, and a lot of candidates. So unfortunately, we've had to shift some things around for availability of parties because apparently the, some of the petitioners and uh, opposing parties on initiative referendum forget that getting out and actually speaking in favor or opposing their um, measures is a public duty, so they actually don't really get around to assigning those till actually the last moment. Believe it or not, you see down at the Eugene Public Eugene um, City Club, there was a debate on the on open primaries, but I know that many times these folks are shuffling speakers and et cetera all the way to the very end. So, I'm uh, today. We have the legislative candidates, and that's District 29, Susan McLean and Mark Richard Richmond. I said Richard here, said Mark Richmond, so I apologize to Mark if that typo went out on the anything important like our schedule. Um, hopefully it didn't go out on the website, but um, I generally not tend not to introduce the candidates by their accomplishments. I let them do this th themselves because you end up shilling for things you may or may not be, want to be responsible for. But anyway, the format is eight, eight, two, and two, and then questions. We have measure 89, which is the state ERA, and um, Ms. DiLorenzo I don't think is here yet. Um, she is running to an editorial board meeting, so I said if she got her early enough, she could go first. She didn't, she goes second. So in any event, for our scheduling, we've got an, uh, the, the District 29. Next week is District 30, and that's actually a three-person uh, race, Joe Gallegos, Gallegos, Dan Mason, and Kyle Markley. And I think GMO may be the uh, general uh, genetically modified uh, labeling may be the second part of that. Uh, basically, John Davis was scheduled, but he had to cancel his, his appearance because evidently he has a legislative committees in session at the same time. On the 22nd, we have Chuck Riley and Bruce Starr from District 14, District 15. And then the 29th, we have Measure 91, which is marijuana, which is apparently turning out to be fairly controversial. I, I don't know how, but um, <laughs> Josh Marquis um, is going to be speaking uh, in opposition to the measure. And we're trying to see if uh, we can get Earl Blumenauer to um, continue the dialogue that he's having with Josh Marquis on the issue. Right now, we have, um, uh, we have um, Zuckerman. Uh, basically, on the 6th, we have um, uh, the first district congressional candidates, and we may, we may in fact, um, throw a ballot measure on there, too, depending upon uh, how, how people respond. On the 13th, October 13th, we've got Ted Wheeler for the school initiative, Measure 86, and opposing him on that will be um, Steve Buckstand of the Cascade Policy Institute. On that same um, date, we're going to have um, the alien driver's license, measure 88, which is a referendum on that issue, and we've got speakers for that. Uh, the, the, the week after that, on the 20th, we've got open primaries, which is measure 90. So for those keeping track, the schedule we sent out with the membership list has changed a little bit because of people's schedules. But we have a full slate of folks coming up. First, th there is no incumbent in this race. This is the seat vacated by, um, by Representative Unger in, the, in Hillsborough. So, and I didn't um, flip a coin to see who would go first. Does, does, does either um, Ms. McLean or Mr. Richmond, do you have a preference as who goes first? Well, then I'll let the, presumably the former office holder go first. And you have eight minutes, Ms. Mc, Ms. McLean, to make your presentation. And then you have two minutes of, of rebuttal. Uh, you can, don't have to take a full eight minutes. But um, again, I don't do the real introductions. I let you introduce yourself, except so far as Susan McLean is here. She's a candidate, and I'm going to turn the podium over to you. Thank you very much. 
Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming today and taking time out of your busy schedules to come and hear us talk a little bit about ourselves. And I want to thank the Public Affairs Forum. You have been a tradition, and also you have been one of those wonderful places where discourse can happen on public issues. So thank you very much for everything that you do to bring information to the public. I would like to start out by talking a little bit about who I am and then I'll talk to you about why I'm running for this office. And then after that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that I hope to work on when I'm down in Salem. But let's start first of all with who I am. I'm a fourth generation Oregonian. I was raised in Marion and Clackamas County, and I've had the opportunity to live in this wonderful state for 65 years. It's a wonderful place. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a good place to live. And those are some of the reasons why I really feel it's important to go forward with trying to help with your communities. Besides being a fourth generation Oregonian, I'm also a teacher for 42 years, and I've taught primarily in Hillsboro. I've been a high school teacher, I've taught English and speech and debate, and I've also taught senior seminar and psychology, and many types of classes that folks take when they're trying to get ready to go to school, higher education, or to get a job. And so those experiences have really helped me with some of the issues that I think I'll be facing in Salem. I also have raised my family, and my family has been raised in what is known to be right now District 29. My husband and I raised our four children for basically four decades in Forest Grove and in Cornelius. And we've had the opportunity to go to a family church in Cornelius, and my husband had a small business, a small machine shop that he ran in Cornelius for about 20 years. Besides being a teacher, uh, besides being a mother, I also have had an opportunity to have some public service before this time of running for this particular office. And I was a Metro Counselor for 16 years and served in that capacity representing folks also in this area. Whether I have been working as a mom or being a grandmother or being a teacher on the job, one of the things that's very clear to me, and that is that what really makes our communities is families who are being successful. And families who are being successful are folks who can pay their, their bills, and they're also folks who can send their, their children to schools that they have confidence in. And so those are some of the things that I really look forward to and some of the reasons why I am running for this office. I want to help those families be able to get those types of family wage jobs where they're going to be able to pay their bills and have a little left over at the end of the, of the month. I want to make sure that we help make sure that we really find a way to uh, give all kinds of support to our schools so that the schools can really do more than just take tests. I think it's important for us to recognize that for a teacher, a teacher shouldn't be teaching to the test. A teacher should be teaching to the child. And I believe that just sending dollars to the schools is not the only thing that we need to do if we want to make sure that our schools are going to be the places that are going to be successful and they're going to provide the kind of background, the backdrop, the training, the skills that are necessary for these students to go on to higher education or to a job. So as you can tell, I really care about schools and I care about families and I also care about civic responsibility. The last area that I'd probably talk about in a general sense of things that I want to work on when I'm down in Salem is small businesses. If you look at some of the statistics, you will find that at least a majority and some have even said up to 95% of businesses in the state of Oregon are small businesses. They don't have as many employees, they don't have as much in the way of resources, and they aren't always able to start their businesses in the way that some of the larger corporations can. And because of that, they are filled with red tape, reporting that is overwhelming, and they don't have the support that they need. So that is another area that really interests me and areas that I want to talk about and relate to when I'm down in Salem. Let's talk then about why now. I could retire, right? I'm 65. But I decided that right now it's, it's time to run for this office. Not only is it an open seat, 
but because of what's happening in our schools, because of what is happening with families and family wage jobs, I think it's important for us to have a strong voice for this part of Oregon in, in our house down in Salem. In schools, I'm going to be working on trying to get those resources back to the classroom and to the teachers so they can interact. A personal story, when I was a beginning teacher, I had 21 to 25 kids in my classroom. In the last five years in my class, there were anywhere from 38 to 42. And you can't have the rapport, you can't help those kinds of kids with those numbers in there. I think it's important to recognize that as far as families and small businesses, we need to work on things like equal, you know, equal pay for equal work. I have two daughters and I have two granddaughters. There are many of the families in our district who only have a single breadwinner and many times it's a woman. And I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity that that woman when she's doing the same job as another male counterpart is not getting 75 cents for that hour or for that job but gets the whole full dollar. So it's important for us to work on some of those issues while we're down in Salem. There are many things that I could talk about and there'll be an opportunity for us to answer some questions. But I wanna end with a couple of things that I think are important as I look to be your representative in Salem in the 2015 session. First of all, I was very fortunate to have parents and grandparents that taught me many things. They taught me a very strong work ethic and nobody will outwork me. And I will be there for long hours, and I will be there until we get some of these tasks done. They taught me civic responsibility, and I always give my grandfather Hobart uh, credit for that, because he said everyone has civic responsibilities. And it doesn't matter if it is just voting, then you vote. Because when you're voting, you're getting to have your say. It also means that some of us need to take on a little bit more, and we need to be willing to give up our time and our energy, and we need to make sure that we are going to go ahead and have an opportunity to try and do some work that will change the life of our children, our schools, and our families. I wanna thank you all again for allowing me to be here. I am looking forward to your questions, and I look forward to representing you in Salem. Thank you. Mr. Richmond, um, come on up. I um, forgot to, I actually have one of my multiple cards. So this means I think 30 seconds left, and this means what it says, but, but we don't have to be Nazis about it. Oh, do you, are you doing timekeeping then? Well, then we just, what's a minute to you hold that up, and then I'll do that. Just hope you guys are on the same clock. <laughs> All right, thanks for having me. I have looked into the faces of children who are victims of abuse. As a district, deputy district attorney, one of my jobs is to get justice for these kids. Another part of my job is to protect them, their families, and the community from their abusers. These children, sometimes little kids, have to get up in front of a group of strangers, and often their abuser, and talk about the shameful things that have been done to them. We try to do what we can to make it easier for them. We show them the courtroom ahead of time. We let them sit on the witness stand. We call it the truth chair, where they can only tell the truth. And we ask them some unrelated questions, just to kind of get them comfortable. It's a tough experience for a kid whether it's a small child or a teenager, they have to talk about things that they would rather forget ever happened and that they don't want the world to know ever happened. But after they talk about it, then they have to be cross-examined by a defense attorney. And these defense attorneys will sometimes ask them the same questions over and over again trying to make them doubt themselves or to create an inconsistency in their stories. I've watched kids answer those repeated questions. I've seen them weather cross-examination for sometimes over an hour without a break, without buckling, 
without wavering in their commitment to telling the truth. I'm running for state representative because I'm inspired by courage like theirs. I've dedicated my life to protecting the vulnerable. And going to the legislature is the right platform to take that commitment to the next level. We need people in our legislature who have experience and a commitment to putting everything they have into standing up for those who can't stand for themselves. We need people who are used to making serious decisions. And we need people who understand personally the consequences of failure. Let me give an example. Oregon is ranked number 49th in the country in graduation rates. That is a consequence of failure that is absolutely inexcusable. We've taken high school courses that introduce kids to living wage jobs and replaced them with standardized tests designed to move them on to the next level whether they're ready for it or not. That's almost criminal. As a deputy DA in the juvenile section of our, the DA's office, I see the kids who drop out. These kids didn't have access to professional or technical training. These kids weren't introduced to the kinds of careers they can believe in for themselves. If these kids had been exposed to careers in the trades, they may have chosen a more different and more positive path. We need to also recognize that not every kid is going to go to college. Some will, and some may grow up to go to Intel. And those who do, the statistics show, will create three additional jobs in other industries. That's why we need to protect our strategic investment and gain share programs from legislative efforts to dismantle them. Those efforts to dismantle them, by the way, were spearheaded by the legislator I'm running to replace, and that would be Ben Unger. So when we talk about that, and when we're talking about professional and technical education in our high schools, that's another thing I will be fighting for. There's a lot more we can be doing for education and the economy, which along with public safety are the three top of mind issues for people in our district, the things that matter most to them. There's a we can start seeing positive changes in the way our government interacts with us if we just take a different look and apply some common sense reasoning to every question. That's what I do every day in my job as a prosecutor. I don't really feel like that way of thinking is the driving force in Salem. Our legislature is full of career politicians and PERS-funded retirees. We need a fresh perspective. I'll weigh all sides and listen to everyone's point of view before making a decision. Finally, let me tell you a story about a dog. It's one of my favorite cases because this one kind of had a happy ending but it didn't start that way. Kalu is the name of the dog, and her owner was a pretty bad guy. Uh, he was no stranger to the criminal justice system. When his neighbor saw him severely beating his dog, the police responded, and they made an arrest. Kalua had suffered serious injuries, and it was clear that she had been abused for quite some time. And some people are wonder if you can safely adopt out a abused dog, but she went through rehab for three years, and today she is a healthy and happy dog with a wonderful new owner. Now, it should come as no surprise that people who abuse animals often move on to abusing people. So that's why it's really important that, even though it can be hard to get a jail sentence for people who commit animal abuse, it's important to protect the public from people like this. I was able to get a one-year jail sentence for abuse Kalua's owner for animal abuse. Unfortunately, but true to form, when he got out, he repeatedly beat his girlfriend in front of their young son. So this time, I put him in prison. These stories show that sometimes we all need someone to stick up for us. Laws exist to protect the vulnerable in our society, and we need people who recognize that and will work with everything they have to do that. I've made a career out of standing up for people who can't fight for themselves. And that's how I'll fight for you. I'm Mark Richmond. I look forward to serving you in the legislature. Thank you.
Well, I want to uh, thank Mark. He had a couple of stories there talking about his own personal caseload and talking about some of the things that he'd worked on in the justice system. And I think that's extremely valuable information for us to have. We're, we're happy that we have DAs that are out there fighting for folks, and I think it's a great deal. But one of the things uh, when Mark was talking that I thought about, and that was that he's at the end of the system. He's having to deal with folks that have already broken those laws. He's having to deal with folks that really not always are able to find a different pathway except for those areas of misbehavior or, you know, maybe a life of crime. And I think part of the reasons that Mark is having to deal with folks like that is because there are not enough people upstream. People like moms and grandparents and teachers who actually do and must find ways to help those kids become successful and feel safe and have ways to really get to a better future for themselves. So I really want to spend money on the upstream types of issues that are there, uh, making sure again that those schools, including vocational ed, I talked about vocational ed a little bit. My husband used to hire straight from Glencoe High School from their machine shop when we had more vocational ed types of classes, and we've got to get more of those back. And it's really important for us to have a good type of uh, graduation rate. But the graduation rate is not the important part. The important part is making sure that they have the skills to get into those jobs, whether it be a plumber or whether it be an electrician or whether it be go on and get their bachelor's or their master's in a higher education institution. But I think that all of us here in this room today would agree that we want to make sure that we're working in the upstream areas and trying to make sure that people have skills so that we don't have to give Mark more business. I'd also like to thank Susan for coming and the, for the work that she's put in the, as a teacher for a very long time. And you know, when I heard her, actually, I was hearing some of the same things that I would say. Uh, we talk about small business. You know, I was talking with a small business owner. He owns a landscaping business, and he was telling me about all the red tape he has to deal with, uh, and the rather ridiculous laws that he has to deal with as a business owner. And these have been accumulating over time. And we need people who think differently, who can really hunt down and see what makes sense and make sure that these people are the ones who can prosper. And yeah, I deal with the people at the end, and that's why the illustration of the work that I have to do has to do with the failures that are happening at the beginning. And we need people who can tackle it, who understand what happens at the end when we do fail these people. But when we work in the juvenile department, it's not necessarily the end. Some of these kids have, yes, committed what would be crimes if they were adults, and we have programs that assist them and get them back on the right track. When we talk about, you know, are we, are we going to send every kid to college, these kids don't believe that. They think that it's college or McDonald's or go sling uh, dope or collect your welfare. They don't understand that there are good options out there. And when they're introduced to them, they hold on to those uh, for hope. I've seen it happen, and it does show success. That's one of the things I also want to push is special courts programs like our juvenile drug court and our juvenile gang court that I'm working with our local juvenile department on. I've seen the work that this has done and this more resources for this are going to help kids get back on track. So anyway, thank you very much for your time and I uh, look forward to your questions. Questions are open to forum members um, only. Uh, and the line forms to my left while people are making up here, I'll just note that the, the legislature in Oregon is one of the places where people do affect change. And um, there's some issues of control in this election as to by the, which party is going to control. But sometimes the legislature is kind of um, ignored by the public generally. I think we know different. But for the speaking to the audience out there, there essentially we have us create a super school board in the legislature, legislature of the power of the purse. So many of the decisions that, we're, that are going to be made are going to be made by the folks in this room. And I'll just call on Jerry as our first person. Um, I can't see you behind the uh, thing, headline there, but I do know that's Jerry Arnold, so. I'd like to thank both of you for being here today. And I was impressed that you both worked with young people. So my question has to do then with the marijuana initiative. <clears throat> Since you've worked around young people, you know the effects, positive, negative. So where do you both stand, either opposing it or supporting recreational marijuana?
Well, first of all, I, I agree with you. We do, uh, we, we have both been fortunate enough to deal with our youth, and I think that that is really a blessing for both of us. And as far as the marijuana measure, it's on the ballot. It's going to be voted on by the voters. I don't know if it's going to pass or not. But I do know that as a mother and a grandmother and as a teacher, that what really concerns me is the fact that I think that at reading the measure myself, that there are still a lot of questions out there about how children are protected. And so there's something called edibles. And I read in there where it doesn't look like they're really much of the way of really being able to control where those types of edibles are put. Are they put in jelly beans or are they put in something that would attract a child to it? Uh, there are th things we can learn from Washington and, and cr also Colorado as far as what they have faced since they have actually um, been passing some of this type of legislation. But right now I have some real concerns and I know that if I'm down in Salem in 2015, which I plan to be, that if this does pass, what I'll be looking for is making sure that we have addressed the issues that I think are alarming about types of uh, food and or digestible other items that children could get their hands on. You know, this is an important question that's uh, come up with the as I said, I work in the juvenile drug court, so I see, I see kids, a lot of them who use marijuana heavily, uh, are addicted to it and have come with problems. So the people, I know some people say there's no problems from it, but there are. And I've talked to a lot of law enforcement agencies about what they've read about happening in Washington and Colorado. I think we should give it more time. I don't support legalizing it right now. I think we should be, take a look. Let Washington and Colorado do their experiments, see what the results are. Some of the initial uh, results, especially of uh, bumps up in violent crime, are not uh, encouraging. So I say we should take a look, see what happens, and then judge accordingly. But for right now, I would uh, oppose that. Thank you. I'm uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. I'd like to hear from each of you about the ballot measure to do away with the party primaries. And maybe you could talk a little bit about why you would support or not support that. This also, as you say, is on the ballot, and so we'll find out what the voters of Oregon are thinking. I think there's pluses and minuses to this particular one. The first one that comes to my mind as a plus is the fact that we would have more access for people voting in May. And so you don't have the independents, you don't have the other parties that are able to vote in the primary. And so if that passes, that gives more access to folks. But on the, on the negative side, it's going to mean more money having to be spent in more races in the primary and in the general. Because I, I ran for a nonpartisan seat. Uh, one time there were three of us, then there were four of us. And so we had to run both in the primary and in the general, and that meant that there was double amount of money being spent. So I find that to be a negative, and I really, I'm gonna wait to see what the rest of the folks in Oregon believe, but I think it's, it's time for us to really consider the, the pluses and the minuses. I don't think it's a one-sided issue. The thought behind it, I think, is a good one, which is, you know, people are concerned about extremism and that, especially in districts, which are different from our district, this is 29 is a swing district, but in other ones, they're essentially one party rule, whether it be uh, essentially the primary, the Democrat wins, or the primary, the Republican wins. Um, but I just don't think right now it's the right solution. I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that will happen. I think Ms. McLean pointed out a big one, which is essentially you're going to have two campaigns, which means a lot more money being spent. Uh, I mean, some people have said they think it's just going to turn to a quick three-month sprint, and uh, it's probably going to get extended before that, which also means if, it's hard, if you have to run two races, I think the number of people who you're going to get who are willing to step forward and run is going to be that's going to be a deterrent, having to run essentially two big campaigns. So right now, I, I keep an open mind on it. Maybe someone can find a way to con convince me otherwise. But based on what I know right now, um, I'd say I oppose it. So thanks. 
Thank you both for coming. I'm Karen Packer, forum member. Um, and I appreciate your thoughtful answers on these questions. Mine has to do with women's reproductive health. I'd like to know uh, your opinion on women's reproductive health and whether you consider yourself pro-choice or pro-life. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. First of all, I would like to tell you that I am a pro-choice candidate. I believe that personal decisions should be made by the individual. I am the only candidate in this particular race that has been endorsed by Planned Parenthood. And I think it's extremely important for personal decisions to be left in the hands of the individual. I am really proud that Oregon is still one of the only states, if not the only state, that allows for those choices to be made today. And I have two grandchildren that are daughters, and I have two daughters uh, out of my four children, and I am really pleased that they live here where they have the opportunity to make their own decisions. Well, I'll say that I consider myself pro-life, but apparently I'm not pro-life enough to get the endorsement from right to life, so I guess you can take that for what it means. So I guess that's my answer to the question, thanks. John McWilliams, a forum member. Um, stock market is going boom, and uh, people up there in that level, they're making lots of money. And um, so I'm a little concerned about the fact that a lot of people aren't making a lot of money, especially in, in lower wage jobs and things like that. Um, so how are you on the minimum wage? Do you, uh, both of you, do you support increasing the minimum wage? Thank you. Thank you. As I've already indicated in my remarks, I think it's extremely important to have family wage jobs. Even though Oregon is doing better than many states in the United States as far as what their minimum wage is, it still has room to be improved. And yes, I do support increasing the minimum wage. I think the, the main emphasis of what I want to look at is creating family wage jobs. And I think even an increase in the minimum wage probably is not going to get people there. So we need to work on creating jobs that are above minimum wage and are going to create uh, family wage jobs. That's one of the reasons I want to encourage small business growth, reducing uh, regulations and looking at the tax code for small businesses. With regards to the minimum wage as it is, we already have a really high minimum wage and it actually goes up by statute automatically every year. Uh, I believe indexed to inflation. So I think that the statutory increases that uh, occur by itself are, um, are good and that's where we should keep it. Thanks. Mark Freiberg, Forum Member. Some people say our land use system, at least in terms of the urban growth boundary, urban reserves, et cetera, is broken. Others say it's working great. What we do know is the last solution for Washington County had to come from the legislature, which no one anticipated or apparently wanted when these laws were passed. I'd like to know if you all have any uh, thoughts or solutions on that. Thank you very much uh, for the question. I don't know if you remember some of the old Westerns, but they used to say, you know, they're gonna fight over land or water. So if you, you know, if, People have definite opinions on land use and have definite opinions on how we use our water. And so I do believe that the land use system in the state of Oregon has to be reviewed and that there are many reasons to have it reviewed. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, is it broken? Does it need to have a, a slight amendment? Uh, what, is, what does that mean? And I think that I personally believe that it means that if you're getting legislative fixes for small borders around three or four cities or part of one county, that it must mean that there needs to be some review and that something's wrong. I don't believe that legislative fix are the way to go. It's a state issue. We are, st we are sharing state water. There is land crossing over borders of both transportation infrastructure, bridges, so uh, it's really important that we really look at the whole picture and not break it into a lot of little pieces or not have to try to fix the system on the fly because it doesn't seem to be working the way it was set up. I think the land use grand bargain we had is a sign that our land use system is broken and some reform needs to happen. 
Now, what is that reform going to look like? We need to make sure that, for one thing, when we are putting together a land use plan, it needs to be one that can come to with a, in a reasonable period of time. It needs to address the priorities that we've set forward uh, in, say, protecting farmland um, and adequately making sure we have enough space for the people who are moving into the areas. And it needs to be uh, certain so that people don't come up with a plan, make their plans, and then either gets thrown out by the court or the legislature jumps in and makes its own plan. So that's what we need to do, because I think given this plan was, went for years, got thrown out by the courts, and then the legislature just kind of jumped in and did it, I think that's a sign that something needs to be done. Thank you. Uh, Lee Coleman, uh, forum member. Uh, for both of you, um, is the Republican failure and even refusal adequately to fund or provide funding for uh, K through 12 education in this state, uh, does that amount to child abuse? Okay, so you get the award for the, the most unusual stated question for today, okay? <laughs> well, first of all, I think that uh, we all would agree that uh, children have, th there are many different ways how um, you're gonna find some abuse happening. Uh, and whether it be emotional abuse or, or whether it's not preparing them in an appropriate way, I think that there are some of those issues that are gonna um, basically cross over. I would, I would stop, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a kernel of your question, and that is, do we believe that adequate funding is an essential skill? I believe that adequate school funding is an essential skill that we have to fund. And going down to Salem in 2015, that's one of my top three priorities, is making sure that we continue to work on that. And I think it's important for us to realize that yes, there are Republicans, there are Democrats down there in the session, and we need to all be working together to make sure that we can fund our essential services. And I agree with you that essential services absolutely include school funding. So I'm, I'm gonna answer that question this way because I do believe that the kernel of your, of your question was, should we make sure that our children have the resources and the abilities to succeed? And they will not unless we are able to give them the school system that they deserve. Well, there are two things that are important when we talk about school funding. And one is making sure that there is adequate school funding. Uh, and that's important. And we need to find ways to, to generate more. And if we get more people working and more people making more money, our income tax is one of the top in the country. We are very reliant on it. So if we have more people making more money, we will have more money to spend on the, re the services that we need to. And if we can find that money, then we should. But it's also important to look at how the money is being spent within our schools. When I go talking to people at the door, many of them, including people, I've had teachers, I've had people who work in facilities in the school district, they've complained to me not necessarily about the money that isn't there, but that about how the money that is there is being spent. We need to make sure that we are making things work. Uh, because I believe Oregon is ranked about 14th in the uh, nation in spending, but with a 49th in the country graduation rates, uh, we are also probably not getting the bang for our buck. So uh, if we can find more funding for our schools, we will find ways to do that. And we'll also take a good hard look to make sure it's being spent right. Thank you. As I announced originally, we're doubling up on some things. So, uh, Leanne, how much time do you think you need? 15 minutes, would that work for you? Okay, then we're gonna take another um, five or six minutes for questions. I think Harry's gonna be the last question. Succinct to the point, concise answers, and we'll squeeze through. Thank you. So, uh, Karen Boland, forum member, Susan had talked about her experience 16 years as a Metro counselor and your life experience as a teacher. I'm thinking you've gone to school board meetings and other types of meetings and been involved in leadership. What I'd like to hear from is Mark. We've heard about your professional career. I'd like to hear where have you had to demonstrate your ability to collaborate with others that maybe don't agree with you? Where is your experience to go down to Salem 
and adequately work with others in the sandbox and get results? Where, where is that experience coming from? Well, thanks for asking that question because that is very important. When we go uh, into the legislature, it's going to be a very close split either. It may be 30-30. Uh, it may be 2931, so it's going to be very important to work with others when it gets down there. What experience do I have? Well, part of it is my, the job I have. Over in the juvenile department, it's more than just prosecuting cases. Uh, one of the things I do is dependency cases. So when Child, Welfare, Child Protective Services moves in uh, and says a child is in danger, we have a case. And that is a, not just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, court case when it happens. There are multiple parties. The mother is a party dad's a party, the kid's a party, sometimes the other dad's a party and the other dad's a party. Sometimes you have multiple parties in this case, the agency is, sometimes there's a CASA. You have to engage in negotiations and collaborative uh, working in order to get to a solution in these cases. And sometimes even though I tend to act almost as the agency's attorney, a lot of the parents attorneys will use me as a, me as a mediator between their clients and the agency to get stuff negotiated. Also, I work with the juvenile department I, on the drug court team. While it is something of a, you know, they have an attorney for the kids who are going through, every week we meet and staff the kids' cases and talk about what's the right way to do stuff, what's best for this. And it's in a collaborative uh, with us, the juvenile department, the defense attorney, and the judge, and we all talk about the issues there. Uh, this is probably not quite as, uh, with its most gravitas is, uh, other things, but I'm the president of the local amateur ballroom dance association, and one of the things is I've, I've been on the board for 10 years, and we run multiple events, and you have to go out there and talk, work with people within the board and within the community uh, who have their own interests, and you've got to move things forward and get people to sign on. So there's a lot of work in getting people to work together. It's going to be very important, and so uh, thank you for that question. Chris Leslie, forum member, just a little change of pace to get a better understanding of your thinking. What do you believe about term limits for state or national levels? The first thing that comes to my mind when you ask that question was Mark Hatfield. And I guess uh, Mark Hatfield, uh, was one of those examples where I think that on the federal level, because of the extensive structure and because of the experience that you have to have to be able to become a chair or to actually be put on committees that matter, that I probably support folks, as long as they're doing their job, getting a, a chance to do that job. I think that Oregon really benefited from Mark Hatfield and his longtime service. As far as the state levels, the state level, I've watched it go back and forth and change even in my own lifetime as far as how long a person could serve there. And I think that, uh, again, if the person is doing their job, they should have an opportunity to do it because the folks that are voting for them say, that's who I want. I want that person in that job uh, for this length of time. I do think it's good for people to take breaks. And I was uh, a public servant as a Metro counselor. I know that that eight or nine years that I took to have a little bit more personal time with my children and grandchildren was really important. You know, the concern with having uh, career politicians in place is, is a very real one, and some people have been able to make a career out of it. Uh, however, a person can put in a period of time working for the, the people that may be more than a couple terms, but able to do a lot of good. Um, and build a lot of experience in perhaps the sort of seniority system. I know we had an experiment uh, some years ago in Oregon with term limits, uh, and unfortunately part of the problem when you limit the terms too much is that then other institutional players, I think, get an outsized influence uh, because they're the ones educating uh, the new legislators or the new office holders in place. So I think the ultimate term limit is the ballot box, and I think that's where it should stay. Thanks. Harry Bodine, forum member. Uh, Washington County is the only metropolitan county in the United States of America with 550,000 people and no interstate highway. We have 217, which if you've been on it any time, is a parking lot from about noon on till 
7 o'clock at night and every morning, what can the legislature do, what can the Washington County Legislative Delegation do to, to get something to be improved 217, which is now under ODOT's plan, scheduled to be widened to three lanes about 2085? Thank you very much for, um, for the question. And if I, if I did have a solution, um, I would really copyright it right away. Because I really think that part of the problem with the infrastructure issues right now, we know that some of the federal dollars have dried up. We know we have major issues in Washington County, not just Highway 26 and uh, 217, but we're also connected uh, to the rest of the metropolitan area as well as a bi-state uh, economic system, and we've got the bridge to deal with. And so I think that it's important for any of your legislators that come out of Washington County to be very concerned, very interested, and wanting to stay on top of what we can do at the state level to try to increase. Again, we've got funding issues, and we have to figure out how we're going to be able to do maintenance, safety projects, and large projects like the bridge. It's absolutely necessary. It's a situation where we cannot have the economic vitality that we want if we don't. And right now, uh, in high, basically, Highway 47, we have safety issues. Highway uh, 20, uh, 26 and 217, we have congestion issues. So it's got to be on us down in Salem to really take on some of those issues and try to make sure that we don't need 15, 20, 25 years to finish some of these projects. Sometimes I, I looked at going over Sylvan Hill, which I drove into Portland for 16 years in the afternoon to do that part of my job. It took us close to, oh, I would say 18 years to get over the hill, you know, to really get out there 285th with that third lane. So it's, it's not desire that's lacking, but it definitely has been in the past a legislature that hasn't found the ability how to fund those issues that we need funded. Transportation is particularly important, especially here in Washington County. Um, I'm sure you've all gotten a chance to drive around here. You all live here, and it can be really hard to get around to 217 being a parking lot. I'm pretty sure we've all experienced. So something needs to be done, and we need to continue um, making sure that our roads, our highways, whether it's an interstate or not, we need to be able to have the adequate transportation resources to get things around because it's important for our economy in part because you can't make goods and you can't have an economy if people can't move their goods from place to place. If your trucks are sitting on a, a parking lot of an interstate, they're not delivering goods, uh, they're just sitting there burning up gasoline. So this is important for our economy and it's important for just the citizens of our county to be able to move around. So we'll take a look at another transportation package and we're going to make sure that you know a piece by piece, if necessary, uh, plan happens. I've talked with Senator Starr who's in the Senate, he's been big on building transportation issues, uh, and I think a, a plan will hopefully be put in place that will make something really good. So, thank you very much. I would like to thank both candidates. This is a model for what a discussion should be to thoughtful, involved individuals dealing with the issues. So, thank you for your service as candidates, and congratulations to whoever wins the election. Thank you very much. Um, the um, <laughs> Sidebar, we'll get the um, ERA on just next, but um, the legislature is scheduled next week, so our legislative candidates can't be there. Mr. Re Representative Davis canceled and Representative Gallegos. So I'm going to propose to the board and probably substitute the, um, that, that discussion to maybe the Senate one on the 22nd. Uh, but we'll talk about that and perhaps put gen genetic modified foods on for next week. In any event, let me now introduce... Um, um, Leanne Latrell De Lorenzo, president of the or Women's Constitution and Equality, once and for all. What well, sounds like a slogan, doesn't it? But um, she's the chief petitioner for the um, state ERA, and she's here right now. She's also um, prepared to speak and answer questions, so come on up. Um, I can say something about yourself, but you can probably do it more succinctly and accurately, so I will let you have that pleasure. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am here to tell you that from downtown Portland, it takes me about 40 minutes to get to my mother in Hillsboro. And the amazing thing is, is that I used to live in Los Angeles for many years, and I lived in Redondo Beach and worked 
in Beverly Hills. So imagine, so I'm born and raised in Coos Bay, Oregon, but I find myself there working for a Russian software firm for seven years. And the distance between Redondo Beach and Beverly Hills is truly an hour's worth of distance. So when I moved back here in 94 to be closer to my family, I could not believe that I was spending the same amount of time to drive from Hillsboro from mom's house, downtown Portland. So good luck with your interstate, and that's not my issue, but good luck, I, I'm here for you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me, um, John. And this is an incredible forum. I can't believe, this has been going on since 1957, is that right? 56, 56. that is incredible. Um, wow. Um, so why am I here today? So we've got a ballot measure, it's ballot measure 89. And this is to place the Equal Rights Amendment in the Oregon Constitution. And the language of it is based on, of course, the classic ERA, which was written in 1923. It is in its 91st year right now of still trying to uh, find its place in the United States Constitution. And that's the federal ERA, and the language is equality of rights shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So our ballot title says government and or political subdivision shall not deny or abridge equality of rights on account of sex. So that's what we have. Um, I think the first thing I should say is why would I take this challenge on when this has been basically going on for almost a century? And the answer is, um, I suppose it takes us back to Coos Bay, Oregon. I learned about the ERA when I was probably six or seven years old. And I could not believe that women were not equal in the United States Constitution. I, I just could not get over it. And my mom was a vice president of a bank. We lived in a trailer court. She saved every penny. My grandmother was a teacher, um, worked three jobs, raised three sons. So I've always seen women working incredibly, incredibly hard. And so that's sort of, I guess, if you want to say, my inspiration. So um, what brings me to the political aspect of finding equality for women is that I used to work in Oregon politics. And I um, ran some state Senate races, Senator Rick Metzger's Senate race, uh, Congressman Kurt Schrader's first Senate race. And then I was recruiting for people to run for, um, for state Senate around Oregon. And I spent a lot of time in Washington County. How many of you know Emanuel Castaneda? Greatest guy. And uh, I've never forgotten him. Just an incredible person. Um, and so I've, I've got a lot of political experience. I know the state very well. And so about 10 years ago, I started researching the Equal Rights Amendment very seriously, like for over 10 hours a day. And then about four years ago, I decided to get my master's degree through Harvard Extension, which is really incredible because it's, it's this master's program through Harvard, but you're able to do this online, but you have to spend half the time in Boston. So I was flying to Boston once a week for eight months, um, and then you finish the rest. And so you're sort of online in this software where you're studying with people from Paris, Saudi Arabia, Oklahoma, and you could see them working in their offices and their homes. And the reason I took this path was specifically for the ERA. So I am very serious about it. And um, you know, many of you know in the 70s the Equal Rights Amendment passed. What a lot of people don't know is that it failed to ratify. So once it passed in the 70s, you have to have three quarters of the states in order to amend the US Constitution, okay? So there was a deadline established, and it's only one of two constitutional amendments in the nation to ever have a deadline. The other one was prohibition, which by the way, passed in 18 months. So, um, so, um, so that failed. The first deadline was 1979. They extended it three more years. And the ERA failed uh, by June 30, 1982. But during the 70s, many states put the Equal Rights Amendment in their state constitution, 
okay? And so 22 states have done that. And what's, what's really interesting is some states that actually chose to not ratify or rather pass the ERA in their state legislature still put the, the ERA in their state constitution. So this is what our goal is. We want to put the Equal Rights Amendment in our Oregon constitution. Now, why do we need it? Don't things seem pretty good for women? The number one thing that I think I can give you today is that women do not have explicit equality in the Oregon Constitution. Actually, there's not one state constitution in the United States of America that has ever protected women, um, and that includes the United States Constitution. And so what do women have? Well, we've got Article 1, Section 20, which says it's, it's an immunities and privileges clause, and I won't get too much into the weeds here, but most people say, well, wait a minute. That says that that should apply equally to all. Well, so our question is, it was written in 1857. That obviously has never protected women because under that same language, women couldn't vote, serve on juries, work the same jobs as men, and the list continues. So... So then the next question often is, but we've taken care of a lot of that today. And, and our response to that is, well, no, we actually haven't. In 1983, there is a law called Hewitt versus SAFE. This is where women find any equality in the state of Oregon. Now, the question should be is, if Article 1, Section 20 in the Oregon Constitution provided equality for women, why then would you even need a law written in 1983 where Justice Betty Roberts said men and women are equal. In this case law, there is a provision that says except for biological differences. So the goal is not to uh, remove gender and pretend that we aren't different in some ways. The goal is to finally protect women from being vulnerable to a different panel of judges five years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. Because what we are trying to do is we don't want to leave women's equality, which is, by the way, 50.5% of Oregon's population, so women are the majority. We don't want to leave their equality left to any panel of judges. What we want is we want that language in the Constitution. Now, that does not mean that it can't still be interpreted differently. It can't be pulled out. We all know that you know laws and our Constitution are written by people, and people can then go this way, go that way, and such. The point is, that's the highest level of protection you can have. And so that is why we are doing this. Um, I will tell you that the support is overwhelming. The public has always, for almost a century, completely supported the Equal Rights Amendment. It has simply been used as a political tool between two political parties for a very long time. This bears out in the state of Oregon. Uh, it's not a men versus women issue. Matter of fact, uh, men actually pulled a little higher. And so um, we have great support from every political party, race, geographical corner of the state of Oregon, and so on. Um, so that is why we are doing this, and we need your help. And with that, I've got the sign, and I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. Yes. We're going to have questions, but the um, television time is one hour. So the Washington County Public Affairs Forum meets on Mondays from noon to 1 o'clock, and the meetings are open to the public, though questions to members only. There's going to be a slight modification to our schedule next week. The legislature is apparently in session, a special session, which both Representatives Davis and uh, Gallegos noticed. So the board's going to meet afterwards. I think we're going to try to reschedule a ballot initiative into next week because I think it's unfair to require legislators to be away from their official jobs when they're required to be there. So I think we're going to reset the, that. Um, but in any event, the Washington Public, Public Affairs Forum... Um, don't buy teeth through the mail. They don't usually fit. Um, it beats Mondays, and we're going to do eight sessions. This is the first of eight political sessions prior to the primary election. So I think we're going offline now, but if um, Mrs. DiLorenzo wants to stick around and um, answer questions, I'm sure there's people willing to ask. Do you have to get downtown pretty quick? I, I have a few minutes. Do they have some questions? That's just fine. Yeah, we have an editorial board interview soon. So you control the time that you're here. Thank we're you. off the record, so okay, thank very good. You. Hi there. Hi, Leanne. Um, Hi. I'm Emily Knapp. I'm a huge supporter 
and a member of the Public Affairs Forum and a friend of Nancy Campbell, our Judge Campbell, oh, who got me sure. getting people's signatures early this year. I think what a lot of people were not aware of is that we didn't have the ERA in the Oregon Constitution, including many of the women lawyers I got to sign uh, the petition. It seems that because we have fairly solid case law, people think the law supports women's rights in Oregon. What concerns me as a political person and as a woman lawyer is that the pendulum in politics swings back and forth. And if the nation and the state go more conservatively and start restricting rights, we need the protection in the Constitution now. And so, thank you for coming, and thank I encourage you. everyone to vote. Thank you. My question has to do with, I saw the vote from the City <coughs> Club. Yes. And the City Club endorsed it. However, the study group voted six to one against it. And yes. I, can you explain that to me, why, why the group said, the study group said, um, that, the con that women are already protected by the Constitution as it is, I believe, and that there are enough laws on the books that they're protected. So I would me. love to. Help me. I would love to. So again, politics. Um, I think the best thing I can say is there are some black and white truths in life. One would be is that women do not have explicit equality in the Oregon Constitution. They never have. Um, we know this not only from the words that are missing, but we know this from, uh, you know, what are we, 155 years old? What's Constitution was ratified in 1859, 2014. Um, so it is, uh, so that's a fact. The other fact is that when you have case law, that is not constitutional protection. We know this. Um, some people might say because a Supreme Court justice said everybody is equal, there is a, an exception for biological differences. But this is where, this is where uh, I sort of stopped talking and uh, I let you know that we got tired of going around and around, so we talked to four Oregon Supreme Court justices who said, you're right, and we said, would you mind writing that down? And they said, sure. So they wrote a two-page open letter to the public. It is on our website. And where this started was a particular organization did not want to support this, which was rather odd considering their work for the last century, but not that odd if you look at politics and all sorts of other little nuggets. Um, and so women, um, women just are still last a lot of the time. They just are. Um, it doesn't mean that we haven't made great advances. It doesn't mean a lot of things. People can still uh, talk about women in outlandish ways, but yet you have NBA heads of billion-dollar organizations losing, losing everything because they've made a racial slur, which is horrendous. For some strange reason, there's just a big exception and has been forever when it comes to women. What does that mean? That means when you ha look at civil rights history, it's not that strange to have one movement elbowing the other movement. Because when you have people who have been discriminated against, they are just simply fighting for the first spot. They want to absorb the energy. They want to absorb the attention. And this is what we do. And so I would say that the research committee, um, they had the judge's letter. I will also say that the state of Oregon has written two legal opinions on this. Um, I will also say that the actual language in our initiative says there is no provision in the Constitution. So we've sort of got all these facts. Sometimes facts don't matter. And that was one of those scenarios. Now, one of the people did write a minority report, which was a beautiful piece of law writing, actually. And they simply use the facts. They use the judge's letter. They use the state of Oregon legal opinion. They use the actual language that was in our initiative. And we, for the first time in 15 years, overturned the Portland City Club's majority report. 
So we did that. We got a yes vote. Then they sent it out to 1,800 members. And I got a whole lot of phone calls and raised a lot of money because they were very embarrassed. The whole um, session was, was televised. One person on the research committee was making fun of the Supreme Court judges. It was a, it was, it was a bit of a sad situation. So what we are doing is we are thankful that we have the City Club's endorsement. We are moving forward. We have open arms for all of them to play a role in our campaign. Thank you. Okay, well, I th that's it, both formally and informally. Again, um, since we're off the record, um, and so the board will be meeting. What's the interest of the body? We we scheduled the the, the legislators to come next week when the legislature is in session. I I, I want to reschedule those folks and put another thing in substitution. Does anyone have a problem with that? I think it's unfair to anybody been doing it in that manner. Okay, so the board's going to meet and talk about that. Hearing nothing from the floor, we're probably going to reschedule the one next day. I'll try to get gen genetically modified foods on for next Monday, so we'll at least have the initiative campaign. Thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate your time.